Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig, reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on Fichte and German idealism. I think it's been about a year and a half since I did my last video on Fichte. I was actually still living in the United States at that time. That's how long it's been. But I'd love to get back into this topic on a more individual texts level, starting today with looking at the 1794 concerning the conception of the science of knowledge generally. Now, this science of knowledge, or Wissenschaftslehre, uh, that Fichte refers to is uh, largely his response to what Kant did with three critiques by instead just giving us a single system. So, whereas Kant gave us the critique of pure reason alongside the critique of practical reason and judgment, um, Fichte just gives us the system of pure reason. And the interesting thing about this is he wanted to do this one science of knowledge as a system, despite the fact that he was uh, he founded it uh, at, through a categorical rejection of approaches that were centered on having a thing in itself be the grounds of experience. So he argues that you have experience, obviously, but you only really have two choices for how to explain the grounding of it. Most people, of course, had um, favored grounding it in the thing in itself, which is outside of that experience and basically unknowable. Um, and yet he calls this to uh, the dogmatist stance, because if you follow that approach to its log logical conclusion, you will ultimately find yourself in a position that is incompatible with explaining subjective freedom. The I can only be free if you instead find the grounds of experience to be the I in itself, rather than the thing in itself. And of course, doing this as a system is going to lead to all of the really strange, but of course delightful, things that you find in German idealism, both in Fichte and afterwards. Of course, the hope to do this as a science, his claim that philosophy itself has to be um, a science with a systematic form, something which is also whole and one, is going to um, lead you to confront these same challenges which basically any system would have. For example, even if we accept these criteria, the question remains how the science as a whole will obtain certainty. For example, if you have a set of propositions within the science, let's say you have proposition B that derives its certainty from proposition A, which is something like a fundamental proposition. Um, and then proposition C within the system derives its own certainty from B. It basically gets certainty transitively at a second remove from A. This will, of course, require as you move down the chain for a certain foundation to be valid in order for all the rest to work. And Fichte argues that the subordinate propositions of the science are certain basically only derivatively. They rely upon that fundamental proposition. And the fundamental principle for basically this reason can only be one in number. Um, and he argues that this cannot go on to infinite recursion. A foundation which needs another foundation is a contradiction in terms. That's not a true foundation at all. The metaphor of ground is valid to a certain extent. For physical constructions, for example, we understand if you're building a building, it has to be grounded in some physical sense. But of course, in the case of an ideal system, um, especially one which is explicitly seeking the eye in itself rather than the thing in itself, this metaphor is limited. It starts to break down. The kind of foundation which the science of knowledge will need will be something slightly different from that. Regardless, every science has one principle which cannot be proved with the resources of that science, because its own certainty was always already given in advance of the inner workings of the science. The uh, thing you find with the Wissenschaftslehre is the peculiarity that the science here does not exist independently of us, so much as it is actually produced by the freedom of our mind. He compares this to Archimedes' ability to calculate a machine which could move the earth out of its proper place. This was something which he hypothetically dreamed up. And although this machine was obviously never physically built, the deeper point Fichte sees here was the role which freedom of thought had to have in order to imagine it being played out. Therefore, um, 
Contrary to Hegel's later warnings, Fichte says that this certainty has to be immediate, because the very possibility for mediated certainties of the lower propositions would fall apart if this one exception were not immediately certain. In addition, the problem of form and content is complicated by the way that each valid proposition must have a match between both. The form fits the content, the content fits the form, etc. But in a certain sense, this security of form is derivative for each of the lower levels. It's guaranteed only transitively from the proper form of the fundamental science. He literally says that it is what gives each of them their proper form. And in addition to uh, form being so important, at the level of content, there's also something of a set theoretical relation in which the highest science contains the contents of each of the lower science, and therefore the kind of content we have here is an absolute content, says Fichte. He warns that if you lose immediate certainty of the fundamental principle, one of two options will inevitably result. Either you will have infinite recursion, in which you will never arrive at any grounding, um, or you'll have a disconnected set of paths. E each of them might have a finite ending, but there will be no connection to the others. In either case, you will fail to achieve the ideal of a single whole system of knowledge, let alone the ideal of an absolute content. He assures the reader that such a principle must exist as the basis of a complete system in the human mind. However, Fichte defines this system to be one which is not only one option of many, in fact, he openly warns that if some proposition were found that did not derive its form and content transitively from this grounding, that would not really be another system. It would be a counter system. It would be a contradiction of the absolute content and foundation of the science of knowledge. He actually gives us a subjective twist. He says, let's just say the fundamental principle is I am I then the counter proposition would directly negate subjectivity by saying I am not I. This contradiction is obviously a vicious circle from which we have no easy or obvious path to get out of. However, any demand to annihilate this circle is actually just a call for knowledge to become groundless. Yet if we're really talking about the problem of the mind's acts and the problem of a grounding, then we're stuck in the paradox in which the highest explanatory ground of all the mind's acts will be the power to determine itself with freedom. We will therefore find ourselves only able to account for the acts of the mind systematically insofar as they are necessarily determined, but we will remain incapable of accounting for them insofar as they are free. And of course, in German, the play on words that Fichte was interested in is the, precisely built on the way that determination and the uh, ways of talking about man's freedom are etymologically uh, tricky within German. And for Fichte deals with uh, this puzzle through arguing for a distinction between the general field of science and the set of particular sciences which in a certain sense branch out from it. So the highest science concerns itself with free acts since the position of the idealist is to value subjective freedom over dogmatic objectivity. However, as soon as an in-itself free act receives some determined direction, he tells us we leave the field of the science of knowledge generally, and instead you enter the field of a particular science. As I quote him, the science of knowledge furnishes as necessary space and as absolute limit or the point, but it leaves imagination perfectly free to posit the point wherever it chooses. As soon as this freedom, however, is determined, for example, if you move the point against the limit of the unlimited space and you draw a line, you're no longer in the field, uh, excuse me, the science of knowledge, but on the field of a particular science, which is called geometry. So the d main distinction for fiction is between the freedom of the mind, in which case you're dealing with the, um, the, uh, the science of knowledge, right? Versus when it's determined, you're enter into, you actually draw the line. Now you're in geometry. And another difference is that although the general science deals with laws, at this level, we retain the freedom to choose whether or not to apply them. However, when we shift to instead observing a determined object subject to a determined law, then we're no longer in the realm of freedom, characteristic of the general science, but 
have instead entered into the need to obey rules which are indigenous to one particular science. Uh, he cites the example of having to compare magnetic uh, and electric powers. That is certainly a meaningful operation, but one which is definitively situated within the particular science of nature, rather than the general science of subjective freedom. For this reason, Fichte does not consider logic to be a philosophical science at all. For him, that's rather just one more of the particular sciences. Fichte's reason for dismissing logic as a particular science, rather than the essence of philosophy itself, is precisely that logic deals with pure forms abstracted from their contents. This, however, necessarily devalues it below the status of the science of knowledge, in which the whole point is for it to have the absolute content. In addition, this separation of form and content is itself merely the product of an act of freedom, something which is an after-effect of a free act of the mind, rather than the ultimate foundation of philosophy. In addition, the paradox where the empty form of logic becomes in itself the content of logic, even that has to be explained through a free act of the mind. He says that that is explained only through the free act of reflection. Fichte argues that there is no abstraction without reflection, and no reflection without abstraction further, yet both of those are impossible without subjective freedom. Likewise, Fichte insists that no law of logic can be accepted as a foundation of the science of knowledge. Even the law of non-contradiction must be devalued to a lower position within the hierarchy. Strangely, he insists that this reason, uh, for this reason, logic is an artificial product of the human mind through freedom, while only the science of knowledge has absolute necessity. In other words, the kind of necessity you have in even logic is not up to the standard of the kind of necessity of science of knowledge. Interestingly, this necessity, which is not simply an after effect of a free act of the mind, is still somehow understood by Fichte to be a natural gift, because you can't explain it any other way with any deeper foundation. Even the seemingly universal formula of logical identity, he claims, A equals A, is not quite as general as it seems, since Fichte argues that it depends upon a fundamental act of the subject positing it in order for it to be true. Yet what did the subject really posit, he asks, except precisely itself? Yes, I am posited because I have posited myself. Because I am. Therefore, is the highest act of intelligence precisely for the ego to posit itself? For this is more primordial even than any logical identity or any abstract law. For this reason, he argues that, insofar as the science has content, its content must be to some truly uh, new act of the human mind, one which is not contained in any of its lower acts. This is ultimately the power to be become conscious of its manner of acting generally. Paradoxically, this means that the science of knowledge is distinguished from the particular sciences by being based on the necessary acts, while the others are merely based on the acts of freedom. This necessity is one which must be respected rather than rebelled against. He warns that we are not the legislators of the mind in exposing these truths, we are rather its historians, and that is indeed why Fichte argued that he could have the science of knowledge as a system yet still grounded in some foundation which is not the dogmatist thing in itself.